Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another edition, to another installment of Fade to Black. I am your host, Dalai Monte Morris, and you know the cast of characters. Well, we actually got a new cast of characters here, other than Teach. Mr. Nia Joke, welcome to the show. Welcome. We Thanks got, for uh, having me. We also got uh, two special guests. My bow buddy that I served with for many years, I'm David Goza. Welcome to the show. How y'all doing? And then we have a special guest here from um, from Alan Bragg's neck of the woods, Miss Duckworth. How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me on. Mm -hmm. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, first of all, T. She told me before the show even got started. Happy Juneteenth. Hope everybody's having a great day. I just want to put it out there because I can't believe I almost forgot because I, when I first woke up, I was just sitting there. I was like, man, it's, it is Juneteenth. It's here. Finally here. I mean, it's, it's great. Thank you, Chief, for giving me that history lesson. Thank you so very much. You're um, welcome. So y'all already know it is the first part of the show with opening statement. And it could be about anything. It could be about anything pertaining to the show. Um, I'm not the show, but to the topic we're about to have or something you want to get off your chest. And what I got to say on my one, I'm just going to wait. But I'm going to let y'all do y'all. And the first one that's going to be up, you know who it is. She's y'all favorite. Teach. Aquaba, Manga Death, Manga Three. I greet you in the tongues of many enslaved Africans. Hello and welcome. Today is June the 19th, and within the United States, we're celebrating what is called Juneteenth. And I just want to give you a little history of what Juneteenth is. On January the 1st, 1863, Abraham Lincoln signed the proclamation, um, Emancipation Proclamation that freed the slaves of those states that had ceded the Union. But it wasn't until between June 13th and June 19th of 1865, some two and a half years later, that the state of Texas uh, awarded their slaves to be free. And it was an issue where the slave slaveholders did not want to free their slaves. So they were able to hold on to them for another two and a half years. And the second piece of information that I want to share is a date that's not as well known as Juneteenth, and it is called August the 8th. August the 8th was, is designated for the state of Kentucky as well as Tennessee because it did not cover their slaves. They did not have to free their slaves under the Emancipation Proclamation because remember the Emancipation Procl Proclamation, I'm sorry, I'm just bumbling over my words, only covered the states, states that had ceded the Union. And those states were border states and so they um, did not have to free their slaves. But the governor of Tennessee, being in line with the rest of the Union, decided to go ahead on August the 8th, um, 1863, to go ahead and free the slaves of the state of Tennessee and the state of Kentucky also followed. So this is my tidbit of history and I hope you're enjoying um, your Juneteenth day. Thank you so much, Teach. Goza, you're next. Hi, y'all. 
<clears throat> I'm Gosa. Um, I don't really have anything to say right now. Uh, this is my first time on the radio show. Um, hope you all listen in and tune in. Thank you, Mr. Goza. Short and sweet like always. Ms. Duckworth, you're up. Hello, everybody. So I'm so excited to be here with you all. And what I want to talk about is more like a challenge, right? Um, because we live in an era where so many things are going on and so many political moves are being made. And the people have lost focus of their power. So I just want to talk a minute about that. Today we had a Juneteenth celebration. And like I told everybody in the car, we can celebrate or we can use this day as a call to action. We can use this day to make ourselves understand what we really need to do to move forward as a people. What we need to do is change the narrative. We're living in an age where our legislators think that they're running the show. And unfortunately, they've got this misconception because we've allowed it. Unfortunately, most of us vote and we go home thinking we've done our civic duty and we don't come back out until we vote again. But how many know that when you vote, you are just scratching the surface. We have to open the door and walk through to actually holding our legislators accountable. Any job that you're on, you get a job performance review. Well, it's the same thing for our legislators, right? Because they work for us, the people, and we have to show them what we need for our agenda. It's up on us as a people to take back this control. And what does that look like? Going to your city council meetings, every meeting. Going to your county's commission meetings, every meeting. The commissioners of your counties hold the purse strings for the counties. They're the ones that's going to distribute funds in your area. So if you see that some funds are going to a place in the county where other funds aren't, it's on us to challenge our legislators and let them know that if they don't do what we say, they don't get our vote. They're so used to having their way. They're so used to running their agenda. And right here, right now today, while we celebrate Juneteenth, we are taking back the power. It is about the people. It is about us coming together, along with our Caucasian brothers and sisters, to use their voices of privilege to help fight the social injustices that we face with the reign and the rule of white supremacy and racism in this earth. So I challenge you, don't sit at home and think you're powerless. You have the power. You just have to use it. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much for being on this show. And thank you for that um, opening statement. Now, everybody's uh, opening statement has been very nice and very, you know, welcoming. I hate to break that up. Two days ago, I came across this video that I'm about to show you that just ripped my soul, just ripped it apart. And me just telling you this right now, I could just, I'm getting that feeling again when I saw this video. And you know me, I'm not too much on continuing to talk. I'm gonna let you see for yourself. Atlanta, where as soon as tomorrow we could see a decision on charges for both officers who were involved in the deadly shooting of Rayshard Brooks. That's according to the Fulton County District Attorney. This is happening as we get a first look now at the disciplinary records of the fired officer who shot Brooks, Garrett Rolfe. In 2017, he was reprimanded for use of force involving a firearm. And as millions of Americans protest this latest use of deadly force, my next guest believes in uh, this case, the officer's actions were justified. Sheriff Alfonso Williams, who serves Burke County, Georgia, says Rolf acted appropriately and believes the shooting has been politicized by the city's mayor and the police department. He's joining me now. Sheriff Williams, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you for having me, Brianna. The, you know the family attorney in this case says that police should have tried to catch Brooks instead of shooting at him. What is your reaction to that? Uh, having 
30 years in the business, uh, police and law enforcement, and 27 of those years having taught use of force and taught hundreds and hundreds of law enforcement officers across the state of Georgia and other states. I just think that he's a lawyer. He's not a law enforcement officer. I think that is it's just a ridiculous statement. Uh, obviously, we saw on the video that the Brooks was engaged in a fight with the officers. They were on the ground. We know that when we're on the ground, we have a very high likelihood of being hurt or killed. It's not the place we want to be. This is not a wrestling match. The Brooks is able to take a uh, non-lethal weapon, a taser away from one of the officers and he flees, they give chase. He's committed to felony obstruction of an officer counts and he needs to be held accountable. So they were perfectly justified in running behind Brooks to, to capture him. He t Brooks turned back to the officers and fired the taser. And we all know I, I, this is a third law enforcement agency I've been head of. And in every agency I've gone to, I've required every officer who, who carries a taser to, to be tased with it so that you understand the incapacitation Five seconds, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. That's five whole seconds that if an officer is hit with that taser, that he, all of his muscles will be locked up and he'll have the inability to move and to respond. And yet he is still responsible for every weapon on his belt. He, so if that officer had been hit, he still has a firearm on his side and the likelihood of him being stomped in the head or having his firearm taken and used against him was a probability. And so he did what he needed to do. And this was a completely justified Which is, uh, shooting. So you think le lethal force here was necessary? It's very necessary. The, the Fourth Amendment allows it. This is the objective reasonableness. And that's where I stop it right there, ladies and gentlemen. As you see, he's had 30 years experience and he said that it was justified. I may not be a police officer, never will be a police officer, but for anybody to justify a murder, you're not even scum, you're the shit on my shoes. And it's crazy as a black man to say something like that. I'm not saying that you should step up and stick for the man just because he's black. But for him being a black man that was in the police, off, um, police force and also in his position, because it seemed like he was in a leadership role and training other officers in times and situations like that, for him to sit there and justify that that officer should kill him just because he took the taser. Last time I checked, when you taser somebody, nobody dies. I, uh, I may of, you know, I, I may need to do my research or whatever, but the last time I checked, I never saw anybody die of a taser or deserve to get killed because somebody grabbed that freaking taser. So for this man, and then for the reporter, for not checking him and sitting there and say, hey, sir, so you're saying that you're justifying that this guy should have got kill were there any other ways that could have been could have been stopped because when you shoot that taser once that's it and then that officer could have gone and tackled him there are so many other ways but then again but then again it's just a shame that that report didn't call him out he just let him just say what he wanted to But this is the problem we have with the other shows that you will not have here. 
with all my panels that y'all see on this show, one thing I can say, if I hear BS on this show, I am quick to call it out as a host, as well as I hold my panel to the same regard as well. If they hear BS, then they can step up and they can say something. And they'd be like, no, 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 no. But so far, I have not heard on this show. We may have different approaches to it, but we all looking and keeping our eyes on the prize and leading in the same direction. But we taking different plans, taking different steps. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you want to justify a murder on television because you got the experience, you should have the experience to know that, A, there could have been other ways this could have been stopped. And CNN for letting this man, this he's not even a man, piece of shit on this show and don't even check him on it because he had experience. It's beyond me and that's where the media is going. And once again, just like the Candace Owens and the Hawk twins, Hodge twins, what the hell you want to call them? They don't speak for me. Because with all that experience that you have, sir, for you to go on the sh to go on CNN, to go on national television and say those things, you're justifying murder. And I could go further and beyond, but I'm getting messages and I cannot wait to hear what my Bow buddy had to say, but that's it for my um opening statements. But let's get everybody up on here. So goes out. I was I'm seeing all the messages that you were saying. I gotta I gotta hear this before we uh head on to the to the dialogue. But go ahead. All right. First first of all, um the initial report was that he was drunk in the backseat of his car, or whatever the case, he took the keys out. Okay, and then the officer asked him take and move his car rule number one you don't move it while you're drunk okay then the officer should have just told me he's not supposed to do that right which i also saw the but i also the saw the video yeah he did and then also the he told uh he kept telling them like hey i'm gonna get take your breathalyzer even though i thought the guy he was rambling on a lot but he was compliant he was coherent but here's the things that People fail to understand because I get like this, too, when I get around police. You get nervous. And I understand you probably going to say, well, I get nervous around police officers, too. But when you're not in my shoes, knowing that nowadays lots of people that look like me are not going back alive, back with their homes and all that stuff. And that man was complying. That's a lot that goes through your mind. A lot. Now, one thing I can say. One thing I can say is when he ran. That's the one thing I scratched my head on. He shouldn't have ran. But it goes back to my point. You're nervous. You're scared. You don't know what you're going to do. And, and then when I saw the rest of the video of him taking the tasers and shooting, shooting at the officer, and actually he missed. That right there, I scratched my head on that too. But then again... So much is going through your mind. It's just like, what am I doing? But was it, but the final question for me is that put all this together, was the death necessary? No, it wasn't. Here's, yeah. here's how I see it, right? Mm -hmm. like, first of all, the officer should have took you back to your house for one. Okay. You're intoxicated. Mm -hmm. Okay. He should not ask you to go back to your Take your car and move it to somewhere else. That that's a no no. Right. I work corrections. I deal with. Oh, I forgot. I forgot about that. I forgot about yes. that. I work corrections. I, I I deal with stupid stuff every day. Mm -hmm. And the the fact of the matter is that the police officer asked him to move his car, knowing that he was intoxicated. Regardless of race, regardless of what the fuck anything was, he should not have asked him to move his car. Because he's setting a dude up for failure. He straight set him up for failure. 
and a dude freaked the fuck out. And I get that, but he should not have shot him. Yeah. Like, that's the type of shit that I see and hear on a daily basis from cooks, crooks and convicts. They're like, oh, you know, this cop did this, this cop did that. And I'm starting to realize it watching the videos and stuff. And I'm like, where was your moral value in, in what we deal with on a daily basis? Like, you have a black man here. And I don't even see it like that. Like that that's, that's the problem that people don't get. Like mm -hmm. it's all about color and race. No, it's, it's a human race. Okay. My thing is, is like, it's a human being. Why are you justifying that? It's okay for an intoxicated human being to move his car when it's against the law for an intoxicated human being to move a vehicle anyways. And then you want to sit there and hand the dude up. For some stupid shit, like, of course he's gonna act a fool. I'd act a fool. I got, a, I almost got arrested on my birthday, my 35th birthday. We had four cops show up. I was like, look, I'm gonna get this shit out of my house and this and that. Eight cops showed up. I was like, really? You need eight cops to take care of one dude? Wow. In, instead of instead of making the problem more than it is, rationalize. Don't make it worse than it needs to be. And that's what these cops do. They make it worse than it needs to be. And I can't fucking stand it. It fucking irritates me and aggravates me to the fullest. Like, Morris, I've I've known you for how many years now? Probably going on um, close to 10, maybe? Yeah, like 10 years. 10 fucking years. Yeah. I'm telling you what. I would fucking rip the throat out of somebody that fucking did that to you. Like, that is fucking stupid. And yeah. I don't care how anybody feels about anything the, to know that if you're a human being, you're going to take care of the next. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's not about it. I got to take a minute. <laughs> I got you. Um, I forgot that you was in correction. So you can help us out with understanding, like, what are the actual procedures that should have been done in anything like in everything? Also, do anybody have anything else to add behind my boy Goza? Go ahead. So, <clears throat> first of all, that just sickened me watching that, right? Because how in the world can you say that lethal force was warranted off a taser? I mean, come on, it's a small shock on your body, but not to mention that he missed. So what would make him think that he could turn on and shoot this person in the back, right? Because then he shoot him in the back? Yeah. Shot the person in the back? You are a murderer, period. Somebody asked me, how, do you, how can you tell when somebody's racist? I said, it, you can see it in their eyes. Demeanor. I don't know if you all paid attention to that man's eyes, but he had a motive from the very beginning. I'm not going to say it was to kill that guy, but he had a motive to do something that was not right. And then come to find out he has other instances. So we need to talk about that. Why are these individuals allowed to jump from police force to police force, operating lawlessly and able to do it? Like here in Michigan, we are getting ready to go up against these unions. These policing unions have too much power. They're allowing these people to operate lawlessly in the street. How are you going to be the law and operate lawlessly? It is just ridiculous. And for this black officer, sheriff or whatever he is, to sit up there and say this, I think it's the sickest thing that I've heard in a long time. And it shows me slave mentality. It shows me slave mentality that you would sit up because most of these policing agencies are ran and the foundation of them is white supremacy and racism. And my brother, uh, David, I know you say it's not about black and white and it's not because we are not a box of crayons. OK, That's however, right. at the end of the day, we see that people of color are shot down, they're murdered, they're beat down. And, and it's all because of the rule and the reign of white supremacy and racism at the core of these agencies. I am sick of this bad apple stuff. Um, Lee Tucson, I call him the general. He said that his grandfather told him, no such thing as a bad apple. If you got a bad apple, 
That means the core of the tree is rotten. That's mm. right. That's I right. think, I, and, and just to add on to that, I remember I heard that quote from somewhere. I used to be in her um, college class back in Kentucky because I remember she said something like that to me. But Teach, you have anything to add? Uh, one, I'm not familiar with the story. So um, I can't really speak on the story, but I'll stick to the clip that you showed um, me. The first mm -hmm. thing that I recognized when the uh, interviewer uh, was prepping us that she was gonna speak to the sheriff, I was expecting to see a sheriff uniform. Now this may be odd or strange, mm -hmm. but I can't count times when official persons are not official uniform when they make official statements. So he was ready for lights, camera, action, had his cologne on, good shave, smelling good. He's taking telephone numbers <laughs> for the people that want to call <laughs> in and date him. That's what I see in that interview. Yeah, I mean, okay? he was looking flashy. That's what I see. <laughs> That's what I see. He was ready you know, for Friday, it's Friday night. I don't know when the clip was actually done, but he's ready to go out Friday night, um, you know, go for some drinks, get some numbers and, you know, mm. see his chances. So by him not even being uniform made me feel he was not even credible in his statement. OK, yeah. um, the second thing mm. that he uh, the 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 methods that he used or the deductive reasoning that he used to justify how he trained so many hundreds of thousands of officers um, in terms of, he said that the guy had taken his taser and he did count, uh, I don't know how many millihertz or whatever, but anyway, the fear was that if he was hit by that taser, that would make him disabled but yet he still had firearms on him, which he was responsible for. So in his line of reasoning, since you're the officer and someone gets your taser, even though they don't hit you with it, they can hit you with it. And because you're responsible for your firearm, you can just unload it into that person. Mm. That is a crock of bull. Yeah, because I think they need to come up with better ways, especially if it's a. Um, from what I understand, he was drunk in his car. Right. And I don't know all the circumstances because I haven't really heard <laughs> the story, but what goes through my mind every time I see one of these situations? How can we never hear about the police? and a drug lord in a shootout? Why do we never hear about the police and a gangbanger in the shootout? We always hear about the police and somebody that's unarmed and usually not committing a crime, not even an offensive crime, okay? So this is what where, where my disconnect, the disconnect for me is use that same force with the gangbanger. Let's see how that turned out. Use that same force with a drug dealer, people that's always strapped. You never hear about it. You never hear about it. You hear about people being drunk in the backseat of their car or at hard day's work in their beds. OK, you hear, you know, when people are at their leisure, whether you're at home sleeping in your bed or drunk sleeping in your car, whether you walk into the store or walking home from work. We as black people have no realm of safety. There is no safety net. If we go to church and pray, Dylan Roof is going to come kill us. Mm. Mm. If we go to Walmart and look at guns, the police are the killers. So for me, 
they the police have to they have to they have to do a whole overall now what i have um heard over the past um few days is so many police officers sheriffs and people in corrections are retiring out just quitting the force and this is happening in many states and they're they're happening in great numbers okay and i'm i meant to get all that data so i won't just be talking off the top of my head but i didn't have time um to get that data but nevertheless police officers are one retiring out and two just quitting the force and i have to look at that right now in the wake of police violence they're calling for these people's jobs so several people have been fired from their positions now what happens when you get fired in some cases you can just bop, bop over to the next county or the next town or the next state and get rehired as a police officer but what if you have been on the force 29 years or even 30 years uh, long enough to have vetted your pension and you happen to be one of those trigger happy cops and you decide to shoot somebody and they lose their life and there's a protest and you lose your job what else do you lose you lose your pension and that is why these officers are retiring out they're like i'm gonna get out before i'm gonna get out before i lose everything Mm. And I just think that uh, that's a phenomenon that so many people are afraid of their own actions, which makes me believe that these actions are premeditated. Mm. Because if if I have a clean slate and I know I've been following the letter to the law and I know I haven't killed anyone haphazardly or just because. I don't have to quit my job, but they're quitting in droves, 20, 30, 40 at a time. And I, I see that's very suspect because that person to the core of them, I'm not going to lose my pension. I got a wife and kids and I got, you know, grandkids coming along and so forth and so on. So they're willing to quit and preserve their job before they step out and get into any more trouble because they know that they're finger is trigger happy mm. true points true points are you got some say goes before we go in the main um story yeah um to follow up on that uh <clears throat> every law enforcement including military corrections whatever type of job that has to do with law enforcement there is a ladder you know you go from uh talking to an individual to uh if, if talking to an individual doesn't work and they get out of hand, you, you got OC, you got taser, whatever it. And, and from what I've seen from these videos, they're not following, following their ladder of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, protocols. Right, right. Their ladder of protocols. And it, it's supposed to be like talking to the individual is the lowest. And then, uh, using a weapon is, is the last one and at no point have i seen that you need to use a weapon between those five or six steps like there's there's always five or six steps for anything all right you talk to the person all right well the person's acting like an idiot you know you you go to the uh uh oc or uh taser and i've ridden that taser that taser sucks 15 seconds of it, it sucks. And you go on to, what is it? I think pepper balls next after that. And, and then so on and so forth. It, it just doesn't accommodate for using the use of force like that. That's the word I was looking for. Use of force. There's a use of force ladder. And, uh, and from what I'm seeing, there's no use of force ladder used. They go from, talking to straight deadly force like there's no point in using deadly force on something that can be eradicated by just talking to the individual and trying to talk them down because 
when you think about it, if if you're pissed off, would you rather me talk to you or fucking you know slap you in the face? You'd rather me talk to you, right? I, I'm pretty sure everybody will agree on that. Um, mm-hmm. You're right. You you want to be respected. You want right. respected at all given That's time. Right. right. That's like if somebody was trying to commit suicide. You know, you don't want to talk them down from it. You know, everybody's like, oh, you know, talking to the person ain't going to do anything. A lot of times it does. You can talk somebody out of committing suicide. You can talk somebody out of committing murder. You can talk somebody out of stealing from a bank. You can talk somebody out of fighting with somebody. It's just it's just a matter of doing all those steps before deadly force. And I don't think deadly force is the option that should be used in most cases. Gotcha. All right. So let's go in here because this is this getting this is getting quite as they would say spicy, and which is gonna lead us into the main story. So here we go. <laughs> All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I'm all about doing innovation to the show. I want to keep doing the same thing over and over again. So definitely with my bell buddy um, goes on here. And then also Miss um, Duckworth is on the show too as well. And then, you know, India Joe Teach is on the show. I wanted to try something to really get to the core of the issue and how we can get there and have solutions. So... This is something I've been going through in my mind all yesterday, including today. So either I'm going to have just one of you or just have all of you on the um, on the stream when I just say this um, category. And you just tell me the first thing that comes to your mind and you just go ahead and explain. And then we leave it to all the panel to all discuss together. So... This first one, I'm just going to do with everybody. So the first thing that I'm about to say, and you just say the first thing that comes to your mind. Ready? And this also go, and this also goes for the um, audience too, as well as our boy, um, another panel, but he's in the comments. is It's our boy, Beast Johnson. So Beast Johnson will be running the um, comments. First of all, thank you. Wish he was on the show. <laughs> but here we go. First category, unity. <laughs> Y'all go ahead first. I'm going to listen. U-N-I-T-Y, unity. Um, <laughs> unity without conformity. Uh, many times people think that unity means that you have to walk alike, think alike, talk alike. Right. Everything has to be the same, but it doesn't embrace diversity. Unity embraces diversity, which means it allows um, the pros and the cons, the ups and the downs, the left and the right, all of the um, 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 polar opposites is part of unity. And unity is, um, I would say is fleeting within the black community and America as a whole. America can and will come together when America is in a crisis. At that point in time, America relaxes its prejudices or its choices uh, or forms of discrimination, and they will work together and pull, pull together. Then within the black community, when there again is a crisis, the black community will come together and they will relax um, artificial barriers, my thought versus your thought, his thought versus her thought. Um, a unity, U-N-I-T-Y, um, unity without conformity, but unity contains diversity. Oh, that was a lot. That was a lot. I love that. Um, are we supposed to go or talk about what you talked about? What you um, no? What do you What do you um think when unity comes to your mind? Okay, when unity comes to my mind, I think where and when. 
I think where and when, right? Because adding on to what you said, oh, we'll come together for a crisis or a good old come to Jesus meeting, right? Or or stuff like that. But when it really counts, we don't see the unity. It is so funny that, <laughs> the reason why I'm saying this is, okay, we've been out here protesting, right? You got our melanated folks that's telling our Caucasian brothers and sisters, you can't say that. Okay, but you've been telling them that white silence equals violence. And then when they say something, you you take their head off. Or even our melanated folks, well, you don't speak for me. You don't say nothing. Okay, well, I'm sorry. You know, so, and you said something that is so key. And I've been preaching this ever since we've been out. We divide ourselves based on why we're different. And that is so crazy to me because we all have our seat at the table based on what our strengths are. So just because our strengths look different, that's the blessing, right? Because then that means that, and I hate to take it to the Bible, even though the Bible, okay, I, that's a whole other subject, but it says that it's a body jointly fit together, meaning that everybody has it, their part, everybody plays their role. And if we would just realize that, there wouldn't be any competition, there wouldn't be any, a need to put people down, we would just be able to grow and build with our strengths and not worry about our differences. Because actually, if you take the time to get to know somebody, we're more alike than what we even know. But we have to begin to be willing to look with our hearts instead of our eyes. Our eyes only catch the surface. But let's look with your heart, looking through the eyes of God, you understand that that's your brother, that's your sister. And your only job is to uplift them. That's how we unify. Other than that, we're going to continue to see. I'm not even going to say that because I speak that we shall unify and that we will take this fight and do what we need to do together because it's the only way. I can't disagree with y'all. I, I I ain't really got anything. If we ain't together, we ain't nothing. I like. All and if if I may add, just very briefly, um, right now, in our nation, we're seeing, you know, with the police brutality and the killings, we're seeing disunity. But then, as a whole, as a nation, we're beginning to see unity through these protests, or the re as a result of the protests. And what I mean is this. Um, in Franklin County, Ohio, they just voted unanimously to uh, add Juneteenth as a national holiday. So that is something um, that's happening quickly, okay? Juneteenth is the day they announced it today that they're actually going to uh, remove Columbus Day and add um, Juneteenth and other states and other communities are looking at the issue, but at least we have today uh, one county who has officially allowed it to be a paid holiday um, in Ohio. So that part of unity, um, breaking down of the statues that stood for slavery, that stood for um, the Confederate army. Um, in, in, in unity, our nation is taking it down and we are accepting it. And that is because we're going into a paradigm shift. 10 years ago, real war would have probably broken out if we would have taken down those statues. But it's at this time in our history that everybody in the nation is willing to go along with it, willing to let that part of history be buried. And there's no reason for dumb shit to happen for us to all unite it's 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 stupid like regardless thank you thank you thank you thank you for saying that we've been preaching that all week we are so reactive we are so reactive and if we get to the point where we unify one but we remain proactive and we remain at the table all the time a lot of this stuff we won't see we sit back and just chill, somebody get killed, we mad as hell, now we wanna fight. Some people wanna tear stuff up, we wanna burn stuff down. 
But I say that you cannot hold other people accountable when you have not been accountable yourself to have a seat at the table. We all got to have a seat at the table all the time to make a change. Yep. All your points, I love them. I ain't going to lie. It kind of got me, got me here. You know, but as a host, I got to stay tough. But for me, unity is what we got, what we got on the show right here. Goes to you the very first white wren. Yes, I say it, white wren on this show. And then also we have a diverse um, audience that's watching this show as well. Hey, I'm Sicilian, so. <laughs> <laughs> so unity for me is where everything is equal across the board with the support of others. So for, for, so for example, when you see a black Wall Street, white people should not be afraid to go up in there and shop and say, hey, how you doing? And vice versa, when a black man goes into a white community and buys stuff and should not have no fear of his life that everybody in the workplace, even equal businesses all across the board where, you know, black people and other minorities don't have to worry about, you know, fight for the top just for them just to be at the top. That everything, if, if somebody is down, like what's going on right now, knowing that black men are being killed, white people should be right there alongside and being like, yo, this needs to stop. And majority of them are politicians that they say, you know what? Fire that police officer. You know what? Charge him. Put him in jail. Let him think about what he has done. That's to me, unity is more than just holding hands and say, you know, I got your back, brother. It's the action. It is the action of knowing that, like me and Goza, Goza, we go back way, way back. Knowing that if anything would have happened to you and I would have found out, you know, I would do anything to help you out. And I know you would do the same for me. And just right. like Teach, I knew Teach for a long time, too. Teach know if she need anything. Hey, Morris, I need help with this. She know I would do anything to help her out. And I knew she would do the same to me, vice versa. That's why I cannot wait to give her her own show. To me, that is what unity is. What, what it, to me, what it should be. And I see that our other guest, she probably had a technical difficulty. So I'm going to leave this one um, to y'all. So the next category, Black Lives Matter. Go ahead, Deej. Okay. <laughs> um, Black Lives Matter. Um, when... The movement first began. Uh, I understood why, because of the anguish that we were feeling in our community. Because though I know no one personally, every young man. I felt was my son or my nephew or my grandson. Every young lady I felt was my daughter or my niece. So I felt it personally. Every time I seen an unjust killing. And I think many people try to minimize the plight of African-Americans. And I think that is inhumane. I think that is unjust. I think really is downright evil that a person or a group of people fail to emphasize or sympathize with the loss of life. I think it's evil when the media tries to dig up and criminalize the person 
who lost their life. That is 100% disrespectful. You know, and in and, and the black community, you're taught that you don't speak evil of the dead. So no matter what a person did, you don't speak evil of. So every time you find like a Tamir Rice or a Trayvon Martin cut down before they even had a chance to live, it cuts to your heart and it cuts cold and hard. And then to hear the media try to come up with, you know, oh, you know, he was uh, bad in school. You know, he was always pulling the girl's hair in front of him. You know, asinine things. You don't speak ill of the dead. So I find that it's very disrespectful. Is it disrespectful because they don't know? Or are they disrespectful because they're just um, more conscious to making the killer look like a saint versus the person that was murdered? Either way, it's twisted. And so for me, Black Lives Matter um, came to be an official cry for all of the persons slain in an unjust manner. So I, I'll take the take the lead and um and just give one small statement about the issue of white lives or all lives matter. I'm sorry, all lives matter. And I don't take an issue that all lives matter. We're all human. And I'll paraphrase and sum it up like this. Each one of us live in a neighborhood with several houses or several apartment buildings. And one building may catch on fire. And I'm yelling for help. Hey, hey, I need help. My house is on fire. It's insensitive and downright idiotic for you to say, oh, well, all houses matter because we're all on the same block but your house is not on fire. And so for the All Lives Matter, it is a popular saying that has one, no merit, two, is not a movement. And the only purpose that All Lives Matter serve is to diminish, to insult and deflect away from the crucial issue of Black Lives Matter. <clears throat> I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something. Next, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a firm believer in the Black Lives Matter, but the white Democratic uh, Party has mimicked, gimmicked, and twisted every part of it um from what i've seen is that nobody actually cares about the movement and 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 perceived the, per the perception of the movement is not what it's supposed to be anymore and from my point of view all lives do matter like Somebody, somebody that is of a different race or um, ethnicity right beside me, I'm going right over there, be it that I'm not afraid of fire. I'm running right over there and helping them out. I mean, to me, the all lives matter thing, I say that with purpose. I don't say that with uh, making fun of the, the Black Lives Matter movement. I say that because... If something were to happen to me, it's not because I I can't even think right now. <laughs> Honestly, like But let me ask you a question. All lives matter to me. So okay, but let me ask you the question. Is all lives matter a movement? It's not a movement. Do they have an agenda? Pardon me? Yeah, they do. They have an agenda. They I, have an agenda. They do. I, Their well, agenda I, is to diminish the movement and the agenda of people of color. 
That is the only agenda of All Lives Matter. So even though when you don't say even though when you don't say it with the same intent as the people who started it, it still has that same tone. It still is dismissive within itself, no matter what you mean from it, because it was menace the fact that people think Black Lives Matter. At the end of the day, we see the charities. Our, our Caucasian brothers and sisters are not being out like that. I've watched terrorists be safely detained. I've watched uh, on Facebook the other day, there was a video circulating of a white man that came out welding. What did that officer do? He promised. Somebody should be scared for their lives, but they're not. No, this is not. This is not. All lives matter is just so disrespectful. I'm sorry. I know you don't mean it like that. Right, but the, right, right. the reason why it was created was super disrespectful. Because, and I'll tell you this every time there's a black agenda, there's always a group trying to slide in on that and take the focus away from it, which is not fair. Can we please just have our moment so that we can make some headway and get to justice? Everybody if we're saying Black Lives it. Matter and people are saying All Lives Matter, then here, here come people, somebody inboxed me the other day, well, elderly people need justice too. I'm like, okay, you, I, everybody needs justice. I get that. But right now, can we please stay focused on the matter at hand because we are the ones being gunned down at disproportionate rates and it's just sick. No, I right. get that. And I get that. And see, the thing is is that um, if All Lives Matter was a movement, they can create a movement to address their problems and concerns. And that's why it's totally invalid because it is just simply something to say, to diminish from what some people have organized to bring awareness to resolve the conflict. To take right the, now, of it. African Americans are in, we're in dire straits in terms of police brutality. And this is not a new thing. This goes back. Even um, with the Black Panther movement, the Black Panthers, they decided to, one, to interfere with police brutality. They took up arms because it's lawful to open carry. And they knew that if they had arms, that the police were unlikely to strike. Fire me, fire. And it was only after the uh, Black Panthers paraded and actually saved the lives of actual um, civilians by one, they were the ones that really instituted reading those Miranda rights, getting Miranda because they would read the rights for the citizen to know what rights they had at the time of an arrest. So we have the Black Panther Party to credit that, and that's standard police, supposed to be standard police um, procedures to Mirandize each individual that's going under arrest, okay? So Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seals, the leaders of the Black Panther Party, they wrote, and made a report that the police officers had descended down on the community and had, um, what do they call when they get you circled in? Um, not barricaded, um, not colonized. Uh, come on, come on, come on. But there's it's a term that when the military goes in and locks up an area. Locked it? No. Locked, locked secure, down. That's what I'm thinking is lockdown. lockdown. Not, not lockdown. Um, when they take it over, um, when they take over the territory, what is that called? Come on, my, I, okay, I'm drawing a blank. But any, anyway, that's what they wrote about. They wrote how um, in their city, the police ratio was entirely too high and the numbers 
were more of a military um dang i wish i can remember the word oh my god i forgive me um but um it, it's like when the military go in and secure a foreign area and they take it over. martial law no it wasn't martial law uh -huh. um I, I, it'll probably come back to me tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> but anyway that is why they decided to protect their own community from the police because too many brothers and sisters were getting killed. And we have a song, and maybe Morris can pull it up, um, by Marvin Gaye. And that song is called, What's Going On? And it starts out, uh, Father, Father, there's far too many of you dying. Um, mother, 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 it's far too many of you crying. Brother, 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 it's far too many of you dying. So this is not a recent concern. This concern has been in our community ever since we've been on this soil. And at some point in time, it has to break. It has to break. And... Um, Though I'm not one that is so for destruction, but I do realize we are at war. And with war, there's casualties on both sides. There's property that's damaged. There's lives that's being taken on both sides of the war. And until we realize that we're in a war, then we can stop um stop reacting once they get to the boiling point and we can devise a strategy most wars you all are in the military i don't have any military background but you have a strategy before you go out onto the field you have a strategy of how you want to be victorious when you're out there in the field and that's what um the young lady was speaking about uh, Trishai, Trishel Duckworth. Okay, I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce your name properly, but that's what she was talking about in terms of not being reactionary, but taking our time to develop a plan and develop a strategy and implementing the plan through uh, legislation, through having our representatives at the table, through education, training our children, I'm totally for training our children just for politics, how to be a political ally, how to be a lobbyist, how to uh, create a bill and get a bill passed. I'm totally in favor of that type of education. If we take our children, instead of buying them Jordans and big gym shoes, teach them how to, what are the concerns of the community and show them models of communities around the world that was successful and train them to be a politician. So when they get of age, they can run. We can put our own people in power. But right now it's just kind of haphazard. Somebody just, you know, graduates and they, they do their best and they get into them but they don't have any constituency. They don't have anybody backing them. We need, for me, we need to go back to the old time ways of building a political machine. If we can build a political machine, we put our people, um, we train our people on our agendas and give them um, the knowledge, the wisdom and the savvy and know-how to go um, to the table and uh, acquire the things that we need. So without that, we're just haphazard. Great one. Great one. So for me, I, I'm going I'm to take bits and pieces and hopefully uh, Miss Duckworth, she um, comes back in. I think she's still having some technical difficulties, but I'm going to take from what each and every one of y'all said because Parts of what y'all saying is true. Goza, you're right about, you know, I like how you said the white Democrats are exploiting black people. Oh, definitely. And I don't believe it or not. Yeah, and that has always been true. 
And we go put politics up in this because people say we politicize everything. Everything's political. Need to. I, yeah. Every I, I, I predicted this a long years ago. I said, watch, everything's gonna be political put from the shoes you wear to the food you eat to the music you listen to. It's gonna be political, so people get over it. So um, but uh, let me see. But I want to add on to what you were saying because the Democrat Party has been pimping the black folks. And they are currently doing it right now as we speak um, in the campaigns. Like, I'm not a big fan of Nancy Pelosi. I'm definitely not a big fan of um, Chuck Schumer, who's in the Senate. I believe they are two of the most weakest leaders that I've ever seen thus far. But with that being said, the Republicans don't have anything to give neither. Republicans, right. yeah, Republicans for me is, is just like, you just going back to slavery again. Well, here's my whole thing on that. Yeah. Is you 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 can't pick sides. If you want unity, you have to be in the middle. You got to take parts of what the Republicans want, part of what the Democrats want. You you negate the the bad out of the Democrats, you negate the bad out of the Republicans, and you move forward because it's human life. You've got to take care of you and yours. And you and yours is is race shouldn't even have a part of the issue. You and yours is, hey, my brother, he's darker skinned than I am. He had, mm-hmm. comes from a different family. He comes from a, a different ethnicity. You know, my sister, you know, she's lighter than I am, comes from different upbringing and whatnot. You got to mm-hmm. embrace that. You got to embrace every little thing that you come across in life. Mm-hmm. And But with that being said, Goza, and all of what you're saying is I, I agree with you. But when you really like step into the shoes of like me as a black man or I need a joke as a black woman, that's when it really gets real. And for you, like, and we already got this cleared out, Goza, you will have my back no matter what. And the same with you. But us, how we live every day, we got to live on pins and needles. Right, you, you can't walk you, in anybody else's shoes unless you walk. Right, in. and for you to deal with what we deal with on a daily basis, already I guarantee you, if we were still back in the Jim Crow era, which we kind of is, it's just three point oh. You would get a taste of what we deal with because me and you are homies, right. or you, let's say, and Nia Job, you she treats you like a son. You will only get a taste of what she goes through every day, getting sped on. You probably be called the mm lover, all that stuff. Um, but in the middle, I see exactly what you're saying because yes, I'm not demon demonizing majority of the Republicans because there are some do gooder Republicans that you just don't hear nothing about. You also hear, you know, Democrats that does mean well, but they are flushed out. So I do believe in that look. I'm a roll with them. I'm a roll with them. But definitely in times like these, you have to choose a side. You have to choose side. It doesn't probably have to deal with like a race or anything like that. This is just on to meet you in the middle of the road, right or wrong. Am I gonna be on the right side of history? Or I'm gonna be on the night, it's not even the wrong side, the fucked up side of history. So for anybody who wanna be on the fucked up side of history. Good luck. But if you know that there's a problem, if you know that your boy, and I'm not just talking to like ghosts, I'm talking to people that's going to listen to the show and just going to watch the show. Right. That is, that is not my, that is goes a skin complexion right now. If you, you have the same feeling or, or believe the same thing that, you know, you know, it's not a race thing, but I will have your back. You have to choose the side of being on the right side of history and have this back no matter what. And just know in the back of your mind that if the roles were reversed, would you do the I same? would do the same thing. I'd do the same thing right. for him. And then also have the understanding that, damn, my role may be rocky, but shit, at least I have a road to like at least walk on rather than crawling with all the burdens, all the like change just stuck on my ass and stuck on my ankles 
and I can't do a thing. That's where we really come to an understanding of what this is all about. And Teach, do you have anything else to add before we go on to the next one? Yes, I just wanted two things, um, and I'll try to be brief. Um, one, there's a documentary on PBS. You can pull it up on pbs.org, O-R-G. And look up the film, The Freedom Writers. And watch that film. And um, I want you to pay particular attention to, uh, oh, my God. my I, I'm sorry. My mind is, um, I can't remember the man's name. But anyway, he worked um, in the White House. And he was one of the, um, one of the official men sent to investigate what was happening with the Freedom Writers. But he talks about his own um, view of black people being invisible, how he was raised in a house that had a black maid that took care of all their um, needs as a child through a teenager and, and you know, up into um, you know, his becoming an adult and that he really did not see them. He saw them. They worked with in the house around them doing the yard and everything, but he never saw them as people. He didn't have any animosity towards them, but he just did not realize that these people had lives. These people had feelings. These people um, were human. It didn't dawn on him until he was sent by John Kennedy down into the South to get a handle on what was happening with the Freedom Writers. So if you have an opportunity, it's called the Freedom Writers, and it's very eye-opening as to how he just did not see um, the problem with Black people, even though he was with them every day. And I believe that attitude is prevalent today. Um, and I think it was uh, uh, Trevor Noah that pointed out that um, beautiful women getting catcalled by men. He didn't think that it was a prevalent problem until he actually was with some beautiful women or saw some tapes and how in a, in a day, you know, men cat call on them all day, just whistling, saying all kind of things. So sometimes when you don't look at something, it's just not your reality and it can be in your face. And the Black Lives Matter is in America's face. And some parts of America is saying, it's invisible to me. I don't see the problem. It's a blinded reality. All lives matter. Mm -hmm. So. I just want to bring up that film. And then I want to ask a question about today, Juneteenth. Um, uh, the, the man in the White House said that he made Juneteenth popular. I'm going to I'm 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 let that. I'm going I'm to I'm hand this to you. I'm going to slip on out on this one. <laughs> you know... He says a lot of things that really um, just have me cracking up and some things that just tick me off. But I don't think I laughed so hard today when I heard that because I, I just could not believe it. How ignorant could he be? No. How ignorant can his followers be? Like, what made you vote for this guy? Like, he doesn't even know what Juneteenth is. I bet you if you ask him one question about Juneteenth, he wouldn't know it. But you say you made it popular? Like, he's off his rocker. Yeah. <laughs> in, in one way, that statement is correct. 
And I think somebody put it like this. Yes, he made it popular amongst all the KKK. They didn't know about it. <laughs> and that's okay, why okay, I, mean, I can just, go with that. I can go with that one. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's part of that invisibility, you know, um, even to the point that the organizers, the organizers that organized that rally in that city on that day, they didn't know about June PC because they had already organized it. It was a go until the black community said, wait a minute, hold up. That's sacrilegious. <laughs> you killed us. You, you murdered us. Uh, you destroyed our whole city and town. You destroyed lives. It was a massacre. And now you want to go campaign on that sacred spot. And so it was the cry from the black community that made his campaign people aware that they're getting ready to create, I mean, yeah, create an atrocity. And so he he did not know it because that's, I mean, Black Wall Street is talked about and it's talked in school, but many times it may only be talked about in African-American history and not in American history. And this is one of the issues that um, many historians have brought up is that we have a segmented history. When you speak of American history, you're talking about white glory. Everything white people did to set up this nation. You're not talking about the Trail of Tears and the Indians and um, you know the trials and tribulations that they went through at the hand of white history or at the hand of the victors. You're not talking about the, um, the lives of the African-Americans as it pertains to history, American history. You're not talking about the Japanese uh, and their plight when you're talking about American history. So our history is segmented and they have to merge all of the histories and stop fighting for, as my professor put it, history is an agreement of lies. They agree upon the lies that they want the public to know and they call that history and we have to we have to move to have a history that includes all races mm -hmm. so we can have a total clear picture of what went on knowing african american history knowing native american history knowing japanese american history is not going to take away from the triumphs of white people, because this is a great nation. And all of us work to make this a great nation. It was not just um, the white people that settled here that made America great. It was everybody that settled here that makes America great. Well, so, so I didn't mean to go there, but Hey, Teach, you know how the show is. You already know how the show is. Um, and we were just doing the topic on uh, Black Lives Matter. So that right there proves that Black Lives do matter. Our next uh, category, and ladies and gentlemen who's watching the show, please, you can be involved too as well with what you feel for this next one. There are good cops. You're right. There is good cops and there is bad cops. So <clears throat> with that said, um, it, it's it's one of those things. It depends on your training. It depends on the ethical background of the individual that is an officer. And I've seen it in every career that I've had and every career that I've came across that – Opinions are going to be different, and a lot of opinions that I see, have seen, and will see, is that there's a lot of racism, 
and I hate to say it like that, but there's a lot of racism between the law enforcement. And it disgusts me. Um, there's really no way of fixing it unless you delve into background or history of that individual and it's disgusting. That's all I can say. Um, so for me, I believe everything that the foundation of the agency stands for was meant to destroy, to imprison, to kill uh, people of color since they were instituted years and years ago. And you have seen earlier, um, Miss Anita, I believe you said that it's been going on for a long time. This is like 400 years of this, right? So for me, I will say there are good people within the foundation of that agency. But when you see that they remain silent when their brethren do wrong and silence is consent, you are just as guilty. So you may not have committed the act. But if you covered it up for your brother, then I can't act so, I don't know. And I have a family member that, you know, is a, is a police officer just more recently, but, and he's a good person, but I can't, you know, I just don't honor what they stand for. I don't honor their foundation. So for me, and I'm not this, um, this man of the police, that's not me, I'm not like that at all. I'm saying that the people, need to strategically be more involved so that we can shape policies that will help break and dismantle racism and white supremacy within the ranks of these policing agencies. That's good. Um, good cops. We're not talking about them. End of discussion. <laughs> we're talking about the bad ones <laughs> so for me that's a deflection they're deflecting oh but there's a good cops well the good cops may be bound by um, a code of brotherhood and that code of brotherhood uh, may say you know we, we're out here facing the front lines together. You got my back, I got your back. And we don't squeal on one another. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I'm not on the police uh, force. But I agree uh, with Miss Duckworth where she says that um, systematically we have to we have to break the system down. We have to break it down and rebuild it because it's not working. It's not functioning, especially now. I mean, look at the signs. All these officers are, are retiring before they get caught so they can keep their pension. All these officers are quitting um, before, you know, before it goes any further, which the law of self-preservation is going to kick in. It did kick in um, for these individuals. But I believe that the whole system needs to be rehauled and uh, racial attitudes needs to be rehauled. And unless the racial attitudes to the core are broken and rehauled, you're going to have the same old thing. And why is it that these police officers um, can be brought up on charges or whatever have you in one police department, jump state and go get hired at a new police department. And you have a secretary that's a typist and she just sit there and type letters all day long. She get fired. And somehow or another, she's on the blacklist. She tried to go to the next company and they said, well, they said, uh, you got fired because you were only typing 35 words per minute and we needed you to type 70 words per minute. 
and she's blackballed and can't get another job because she typed too slow. But a police officer that's been recommend, reprimanded, um, uh, you know, things written up in his file on suspension with pay, uh, just leave that police department and go to another. How come that police officer isn't quote unquote blackball, which you're not supposed to blackball anybody. But what I'm saying in the hiring practice and the background check, maybe they're saying, oh, so you have been reprimanded for racial violence. Okay, I think we'll hire you. Come on. That's the way it appears to us. Now, that may not be the way it plays out, but that's the way it appears. Okay, I'm going to have to switch, um, switch phones now because this one is dead. Okay, all right. I'm going ahead and uh, take you off teach for a little bit. All right, so now, like I said, now it's just us. So <laughs> I think this one is more up your alley. So I'm going to leave, leave the floor to you when I uh, say this category. Protest. Hmm. So, you know, I'm glad that you brought this up. Um... We had it. We always got somebody talking about efforts, but we had someone that said that will make a career out of protesting. <laughs> I'm like, I don't understand your rationale, right? Um, it's not about making a career out of protesting. It's about you don't go away until you get results. And people think that that looks like a oh, protest in one or two times. That's not what it is. And a protest comes in many different forms. A protest is just you saying, I do not accept that because this is an injustice in fighting against it. But we look at it like a one-time thing, a two-time thing, a three-time thing. This should be a continuum of efforts. This should be a continuum of, of, of being there and being uh, in city council meetings every time, being, like I said earlier, being at your commissioner meetings every time, you know, voting every time. These are ways where you gain back the control. This is how we dismantle the rule and the reign of racism are through these acts. So protests are so important. It just happens to right now, we're taking it to the streets at this point. But we're also moving forward with community think tanks. Everybody says we need to have community conversations. We've been conversating for a very long time. I just made up a word, right? We've been in conversation for a very long time. So now it's time that we know what the problem is. It's racism. It's white supremacy. What are the solutions? So we are moving to have community think solution-based community think tanks where we come together and we say what needs to happen. Then the next step is taking it to our legislators, inviting them in, inviting the Senate in, right? Inviting the city councils in because your city council can write an ordinance that deals and addresses, addresses racism at these, at these agencies. Your state legislators, your Senate, your state reps, they can enact laws. So there are so many things that can be done. And to me, it's all a form of a protest. And it's just saying that mm -hmm. we're not going away. We're going to stay the course this time. We're going to do what needs to be done to bring about change so our children don't have to fight like we do. Anybody else want to add on to that? It was um, the category okay. was Okay. I thought David was going to speak up. Well, um, I, was, I was waiting. Sorry, I didn't know the whole question, so I was waiting. Oh, the, the question was protest, or oh, the word thrown out was protest. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. I'll wait. <laughs> okay. Well, I think um, protest, um, how could I say this? Um, you know, I always have to go back and come forward. Um, protest is necessary. Protest um, 
is a vehicle that is used to make change. Uh, protests we have seen in the United States has been successful to make change. We're witnessing the change. Whether you agree with the change that's going on now, we are witnessing the change as a result of the protests. Protests fall up under the category of a nonviolent, non-warlike uh, strategy for change, a non-bloodshed form for change. And um, that's one of our rights as a US citizen is the right to protest. Um, I, I think it works. I don't think it's the best method, but it is working. And for the African-American, I would like to say this in terms of protest. We have pushed the envelope in terms of resolving conflict without bloodshed. Our nation has fought wars, the Revolutionary War, War of Independence, the Great War, the Spanish-American War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, and others. And all of these wars war, were to aggravate for a change, to put ourselves in a better position. So we added up the cost of how many young lives would have to be spared in order to achieve our goal and our objective. But for the African-American on this soil, we have not taken up arms to shed blood to make a change. Rather, we have mastered, and what you see is mastering the art of conflict resolution. We're making a change without declaring bloodshed. We're making a change without declaring war. So that makes it distinctive in the way that our country as a whole practices conflict resolution. Just think if our country as a whole practiced conflict resolution in where we're fighting now, in Syria, Iran, Iraq, Serbia, we're somewhere shedding blood, <laughs> okay? I may be wrong with the actual locations because I really don't keep, I'm not a war person, so I just don't pay attention to those details. But we are actively engaging in bloodshed somewhere around the world. And I will say, go on to say this, that though we are currently in wars around the world, the average United States citizen, unless they have a member that's in the military um, or military themselves, unless people like me, we go to work, come home every day, America has mastered the art of fighting wars on foreign soil. So we Americans, though we may be in war, we don't feel the effects of being in a war because we go to school, work, we carry on our lives as if nothing is happening and it's not. So just think if you put yourselves in one of those war-torn areas where America is currently fighting, they don't have the same life. They're running for their life. They're dodging bullets, dodging missiles, not knowing where they're going to get food from, running to a refugee camp, family members missing. 
They having a totally different existence. So when I look at America as a whole, their number one choice for resolving conflict is bloodshed. But when I look at the African American and when they have a grievance and they want to make a change, they'll use protest. And that protest is nonviolent. That pushes the envelope of non bloodshed conflict resolution. I think protests are great. Um, unfortunately, we're in 2020 and not everything goes well as planned. You know, cops running over people, people killing people, looting, rioting. You got to you got to think about <clears throat> when you go back to protesting and whatnot, Martin Luther King, one of the greatest protesters ever to walk this earth, one of the greatest protesters, silent professional and becoming. And unfortunately these days you get quiet protests, but then you get those other individuals that come out and start throwing stuff, start some act of violence. And that's just not helping the situation. And I'm a firm believer that protests do get things done, but we had a protest here where I live and uh, I said, well, why lay in the street? Why, why stop the businesses from making money? Because when you think about it, most of the protests done back in the day, they stood at a uh, podium, you know, most of Martin Luther King's speeches were done at a stage on a podium. Right. So, you look at the stuff that we're doing these days, okay, mix it up, have a barbecue. I, I love eating food. I'm sorry. If I'm going to protest, I'm going to be eating some food. And I'm, gonna, you know, whatever the case may be, I'm going to be eating some food. But, you know, church services, you know, everything revolves around equality, unity, and everything else. But you can't have equality and unity with the things that happen nowadays because somebody always wants to be an asshole regardless of what it is. Somebody wants to be an asshole and it turns into looting. So you're doing all this protesting along the streets and alleyways, wherever it may be, but you got to think about the communities within those streets that have to feed their families. You know, a lot of, a lot of things going on these days is, um, people marching up and down streets. Okay. Well, those businesses are closing, be it a black community, a Mexican community, Asian community, Italian community. They got to close their businesses because they don't know what's going to happen because most of the individuals out there, be it they, they, they want to be peaceful. You always have that one person that's going to start something else that doesn't need to be. So that person who may be a part of the Asian community, the black community are stopping the other individuals for, to afford the money to be able to feed their families. So when it comes down to it, like these, these protests these days aren't really helping the situation. It's, I think it's hindering it because there's nothing that they're doing for any of the communities be it white, black, Asian, Hispanic, whatever, if they took it to an area where they weren't shutting down other businesses and stuff so they can't feed their family, then by all means, protest away. But just don't take away from the communities that could have. Um... So <laughs> just want to address that just a little bit. You know, this is with all due respect. Um, but your statement for me is one of privilege, right? Um, because when you think of protest, it is to provide a nuisance to say that we're not going away until we see change. 
But what I think that people don't understand, there are many forms of a protest. It's not just taking to the streets. We've done email protests where we bombarded the um, the email of um, the prison, the Michigan Department of Corrections and the governor during this COVID crisis um, so that, you know, we could get some help to the prisoners who were just unattended during this crisis. Um, there are many things to do. Showing up at the commissioner meetings, 200 people deep, 500 people deep. That's a protest. See, when people hear protest, all they think about is taking to the streets. But protest means that we are not going away until we see change. So, and you talk about the families that can't feed their family because of a day or two of protest. But I think about the family of Breonna Taylor. She can't feed her kids anymore. Her kids have to stay with someone else. We don't know what their situation is like. That's extra moms to feed. So what about that family? Let's talk about George Floyd, whose daughter, um, I believe her, her, his funeral was on her birthday. Let's talk about that. You know, so I'm sorry if people got to miss a couple of days of dollars. That's privilege to say, don't take my money away. We know you want to, you know, uh, we know you want to protest and go over there and do that. You know, we don't have anything to do with that. But like we've been preaching all week, if something happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. And that means that we all need to rise up. So let me tell you what we've been seeing. We've been seeing businesses bring us water. We've been seeing businesses bring us snacks out. Today, there was a food truck lady that pulled up and gave us plant-based sliders. That's what we've been seeing. Because what these businesses should do is not be in our communities making money. They should be giving back to the cause. So I understand what you mean, but I just, you know, and I apologize for my passion. Well, I can't really apologize. It's nothing personal. It's just that, to me, that was a statement of privilege. Really? You know, because we don't get to, we don't get to take off this skin. We don't get to stop being killed by the police. We don't get to stop being beat by the police until we change laws. And the only way to do that is to rise up and let our voices be heard. And I think, um, I think what uh, the average person simply does not know is that, you know, the Bible speak of wars and rumors of wars. We are in a rumor of a war. And what a rumor of a war is, is simply an undeclared war. We don't have two military um, opposing teams. We have everyday people and a system that they're fighting. And in war, there are casualties. There is property loss, there is value loss. And things have to sometimes be torn down so that they may be built back up properly. We have to dismantle the system of racism. We have to dismantle it. And a dismantling, it means that there will be property loss. There will be a loss of the way of life. You will not continue as if nothing happened as if it was yesterday. So these are the, um, the process of change. But one of the things that I see that when um, these communities, one of the reasons um, why World War I and World War II was so successful for the United States is because strategically they knew when to enter the war. And entering the war, it created jobs. Creating those jobs um, boost, boost, boosted our economy. And that's where we got the baby boom. Wow, Americans have money, so now they can have more children. That's where the baby boom came from because we went to war. War created um, reconstruction of those buildings. Those contracts go to the architect or to the contractors um, that build. Uh, commercial and housing development and neighborhoods. All of that is going to be rebuilt. So everything that's destroyed, it plants a seed to be rebuilt. So we have to understand that this is war and we will have casualties. It is not pleasant. It is not pleasant. But in order for change to come, you have to make a change. And this is the change 
through this protest. Now I'll speak um, to uh, the uh, the ones that actually started uh, the physical damage. Um, they were outside um, hate groups. These groups are the ones that started the uh, fire bombing. These individuals attached themselves within the protest to make it appear that it was part of the original plan and agenda of the protesters. And media have shown case after case after case, either it was an undercover, uh, undercover cop, a person from the Anifa, the Boogaloo Boys, um, or the Proud Boys. And there's other groups that wanted this to really escalate into a race war. And they have been unsuccessful. So to tie in the looters and the, um, the people that are uh, destroying property in with the original protesters is a great misnomer. It's unfortunate that it happened, but we don't have to take that credit. We don't have to say just because we protested and outside groups came in that we totally agree with them. We do not have to take that stand. You cannot blame me for something I really didn't do. And especially if it's not my agenda, because if you understand the nature of the original African, it is not to shed blood. We didn't know violence until the, in ca the capturing and enslaving of the African. That was the first violent act that Africans experienced. I'll give you a history, short history of King Shaka Zulu. Most people know Shaka Zulu because he is valorized and he is known well throughout the British kingdom. And the reason why King Shaka is known versus King Mashoshua is because of all the kings during the invasion, Shaka was the only one that took up arms to fight against the British. Because prior to that time, the Africans used what was called a war dance or competition and is known widely now as Capriera. And it is a war dance where they, where they have creative moves. And basically whoever outdanced the other group won the war. They took captives. They did not shed blood. It was only until King Shaka said, oh, these white people, they don't understand our war dance. They take blood. And when they have killed their victim, they claim victory. And King Shaka said, no, not I, no, not my people. We will fight back with bloodshed. And he devised a better tool that enabled his army to be successful against the British. So understand why King Shaka became popular and well known because he used the same tactic of shedding blood to defend his land that other kings did not use because they, before the Europeans came to the African soil, there was no such thing as bloodshed to resolve conflict. And that is why we, the Africans, continue to push for non-blood shedding conflict resolution through the act of a protest. We are different people. We have different ideologies and we will operate from those ideologies. So it's important to know, again, we are at war and there will be bloodshed. There will be property damage. 
There will be a change of life. There will be a change of outlook. It will be a change of mind. But hopefully in this protest, the agenda is to dismantle systematic racism. That is the change that we're looking for. And as President, former President Obama say, be the change that you see. Dang, Teach, good grief. You and uh, Duckworth, good grief. N number high fire. Like, sheesh. But, um, man, I'm telling you, I wasn't, to tell y'all the truth, I wasn't expecting it to be like this. Um, I just like how everybody's putting their side up in here. I was expecting a screaming match, screaming confrontation, but that didn't happen at all. Um, Goza, I'm, man, I appreciate you coming on this show and also just giving your side out there. Pretty cool, man. And then, Duckworth, thank you for coming on the show. And Teach, you always be spitting hot fire every show, so I don't need to like keep congratulating you and all that stuff. You you gonna bring it anyway? Yes, you do. <laughs> so um, I got a, I got a few. I got a few more <laughs> for y'all. It, it's just going to get deeper from here. Um, it's, it's funny. You don't even have to lead on with the question. You just say a word and it just sparks a conversation. I All right. Person, God damn it. <laughs> My ass is starting to hurt. <laughs> so um, the next one, the rebel flag. Okay, the rebel flag, the Confederate flag. Um, well, uh, it's, it's part of it's part of our Southern history. Um, I think it needs to be um, rested, so to speak, uh, laid to rest because they lost the war. That that time period. And our history is over. I do know there are individuals and even groups that are planning and strategizing however they can to try to re-erect and, and re-erect that old quote-unquote glory. But it should be rested. It just simply should be arrested because it is it's time past. It should be put in a museum and for people to go and say, see, this is how we used to think. This is how we used to act when we held slaves, but we no longer hold slaves. And so we, it's a relic of our past. That's it. Teacher, I will say this. Okay, <laughs> I, I would say that for um, for people, for young people to idolize it, uh, it is is it, it, it's it's a it's a cancer that need to be eradicated. It's a cancer that needs to be eradicated. It doesn't need to be worshipped. Nobody needs to sit around and dream about what their great, 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 great grandfather used to own slaves and how they used to go in with the winches and get all the nookie they wanted and fantasize about how much money they could make if they only had free labor. It's a relic that needs to be laid to rest. Definitely. Definitely. That's it. Retire it, abolish it, ban it, because what it represents is so evil. It's so, so evil. And to me, when people parade it around, they're making a statement. They're drawing, it, they're drawing a line in the sand and saying that their values are lining up with this flag. So it's not like they're just hanging it out and it's just about history it means something. It means hatred. It means racism. It means white supremacy. And in our America, it should not be allowed. Well, um, 
I don't think I need to say anything on that to add because y'all both said what um, I was thinking. Uh, Goza, unfortunately, he has some uh, family issues, and so he will not be continuing to show. But Goza, if you're listening right now, I'm about to send a message. Um, please, may you come back on this show because I think we had a very great discussion. So hopefully he'll be able to come back. So I'm going to have um, Dan, go ahead and take this question right here. Are y'all able to see the question? Yes, he's asking, are you talking about the circle with three stripes or the X? I think we talk about all of them, whatever version it is, because I believe, because <laughs> <laughs> I believe, because I, me being a sports fan that I am, and I, I watch college football, I do not like the SEC. So when I say this, it's not me saying that I love the um, SEC uh, college. I think that conference is overrated. But the president of that conference, because they are, I think they are hosting the SEC championship game in Memphis. They told Memphis that they want to have any uh, any more SEC uh, championship games to do something about that flag, to take those bars out of it. And for me to see change so rapidly happening after this protest, it really just turned my perception on protests just a little bit. Just a little, I won't say a little bit. I will say a lot, but not to a point to uh, make me change my mind. It just made me just consider it, to give it props. Give it props and give it consideration. I leave it at that. But yeah, me being from Virginia, um, Dan, who's watched the show, and then I know others that are going to be watching the show that's from Virginia, we're used to seeing the Confederate flag almost every day as you see the United States flag being, being raised. I actually did ask, you know, a couple um, friends of mine that wore the flag. And I always asked them, I said, so what did that flag mean to you? He says heritage. But in the back of my mind, I know that that flag didn't represent me. And they get offended. When I look at that United States flag, you, you can say that the country, you know, it never stand by us. It was never for us. But let's not forget. There's people that look like me, teach that look like you, Ms. Duckworth, they look like you, that served in this country. The military, yes, they have, you know, racial issues and all that stuff. But remember, I remember the saying that happened years ago, and I'm shocked that he's not saying it no more. We, our ancestors built this country for free. So every time when I look at that United States flag, I see us in that flag. That's us. So for anybody who believes that looks like me, that believe that flag don't represent us, you're crazy. Because that flag, let's be clear, was knitted by a slave. Now think about that. Let that just marinate on your mental real quick. But for seeing the Confederate flag... Go ahead, teach. I just wanted to add that the um, the Confederate flag um, they have several models, but the main thing to know is that these represented the states that ceded the Union. Yes. So they basically it represents treason. It represents yeah. treason. Um, because they are now currently part of the United States and part of the um, Reconstruction, they had to denounce their involvement with the Union with a promise that they would never go against the Union to be readmitted back into the state. So to continue to carry the flag is a continual statement of treason. They lost the war. So they have to give it up. They, they lost the war. They had to give it up. So I think it's important to um, for, for those sub, subners 
uh, the flag represented a past way of life. It cannot be a current way of life because as a current way of life, the only way it's playing itself out is by being racist. So this is where another change has to come, a change in the mind. In the past, we wove this, you, you know, we wove this flag because um, we were fighting for states' rights. And basically, states' rights mean we were fighting for the right to keep our slaves. <laughs> which they are still fighting for, for today, but people don't want to go back to the origins of states' rights, which is crazy to me. So now, right. so now we're going to move on to uh, another one. It's Like I said, it's only getting deeper from here, y'all. Um, I just want to check in. Uh, Miss Duckworth, are you still there? Yes, sir. Okay, cool. All right. I was around, and I'm sorry, because I didn't know the show was going to be this long, and we just came in from like four or five hours of protest, and so I'm like, oh, I had to do this and do that. So yeah. I'm here. I was just walking around with my phone, but I great got job. You. Got you. So now this next one is going to, uh, I think this one's going to be, I just why I wish Goza was still here, but this one's really going to hit the core of almost everything. Uh -oh. White privilege. Oh my goodness! So I got it. I get. I, I must really talk about this because it it is affecting my life right now, and I hope I do not get emotional. On Tuesday, someone, a, a, an elderly white woman, ran through our protest. She came up blowing her horn, like, y'all get out the way. Mind you, we were on our way out of the street. So there was no reason for her to do any of this. All she had to do was wait. There was an elderly white gentleman that was on his bike. So I stepped up and I said, no, you gonna wait. You wait, you gonna wait. We are on our way out of the street. She kept edging forward. Her car made contact with my knees. My knees aren't that great. So they buckled and snapped really loudly. So I moved out of the way. Spirit said, move now. So I moved out of the way. And I, I was by her door now. And I'm pleading with her. She has such this evil, evil look in her eye. She never cried. She never looked scared. She just had this evil look in her eye. And I'm, I, I, I'm, we're on her door. Somebody had grabbed her window on the other side, just trying to get her to just stop. She took off. And the elderly man just in the hair, in an instant, jumped off that bike or threw that bike down and she ran over the top of that bike. She left the scene. Knew she was elderly. I didn't know how old she was. The police were called. The police came along with the fire department personnel. The fire department personnel pulled up, asked if we needed any help. I don't trust this area. It's Taylor, Michigan. They're one of the racist, most racist institutions um, that you could ever find. The police pulled their looked at us, gave us a smug look, and pulled off. They never took a report. They never investigated. That was a, a scene of a crime. She used her car as a weapon. To me, that looks like hate, a hate crime. So anyways, they went and punched out and left. An hour or so later, they sent officers. Ten deep. The crime's over. Why did you have to come ten deep? They asked us questions. They were really nasty. And I said, well, what are you going to do? Oh, we're going to go talk to her. I said, talk to her? You mean to tell me she just rolled through protesters and could have cost somebody their life and all you're going to do is talk to her? I was like, wow, because we all know if I had a roll through some protesters 
and did what she did, I'd be in jail right now. I'd probably be on my way to in prison or or I'd be in jail. You know, they'd be uh, thinking of all of these charges. She's home now. The news finds out who she is. They start reaching out to her. And what does she say? I'm going to let y'all guess. Teach, what you think she said? They were in my way. <laughs> what do they always say when it comes to us? I am in fear. Oh, they, she was scared. For my life. I wasn't scared. I was in fear for my life. Look at that picture, Teach. Do she look like she is scared? And I said, nope. look, I said, I'm a social worker. I practice knowing effect. Okay? That does not look like scared. It doesn't look like fear. There were no tears. Then she wasn't shaking. There was no anxiety. That was a look of pure hate and disdain for protesters that are protesting Black lives. She was questioned the next day and she was released. And to this day, no charges. So it's what? Three days later, no charges. With the narrative being shaped by the media that she was scared. And I said on the news today, that is nothing more than a cry of white privilege that thinks that you're gonna get out of this hate crime by exercising that in this moment. Come to find out the lady is 76 years old. I don't know who, I don't, I don't wish prison on nobody, but I feel like she needs to be held accountable. I feel like the way the officers handled it was so despicable. We've been protesting in peace. All, ever since we out, that's all we screaming is peace, peace, peace. Yeah, we're met with the highest form of violence, just like you said earlier. Y'all, I'm sorry, it just it's traumatizing, but not to the point of defeat. Traumatizing enough for me to continue the fight because I know that that is what God has anointed me to do, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. But it's just disheartening to know that people can hate you for no reason and use their privilege to avoid consequences of something that they should be held accountable for. I'm sorry um, you had to experience that, but it gives you power. It gives you more powerful testimony going forward. Like you said, it's not going to defeat you. It may hurt your feelings, but it will hurt your knees, but it strengthened your resolve. It strengthened your resolve. If you ever doubted after going out and protesting, like, what am I doing? Oh, I'm not going to go tomorrow. But you think about, the, oh, yes, I'm going tomorrow. So it strengthens your resolve. And a lot of people ask the question, well, why do they hate us so much? And my answer, they don't hate us. They are jealous. They are jealous of us because we are the original people. And I think it was the last show we talked about the first man. And I made the statement and I'll, I'll make it again. Do you know the benefits of being the first man? The first man that God created with his hands and breathe breath into his nostril. God put his hands actually on that man. That is power. That is powerful. We were the original people and all other people come from us. They came as a byproduct of us. And I, Anita, I have what they call the Eve gene. I had my DNA test and I had to have uh, a DNA uh, genealogist read my test for me because the way they produced them at the time that I got them, they were so scientific, the average person couldn't understand what they were saying. But he explained it to me. The average person 
each racial group has a four digit um a four digit DNA code. I have an eight digit DNA code. And he said that I was the first person the DNA that he read. And what that means is me, Anita, with my DNA code, I have all the DNA codes of every race of humans on this earth. So I, Anita, am a descendant of the first man that God breathed breath into his nostrils. I carry that code. And so what does that code carry? We talked about this the other day on the show. The continent of Africa is the only continent that's rooted in the earth. All the other continents just float on the water. Africa is the Garden of Eden. Everything to sustain our, sustain our life is found in Africa. Everything to sustain the life of everyone else on the continent is found in Africa. Every time you get in your automobile, you're driving on tires that's made on rubber that only comes out of Africa. Every time you pick up your cell phone, your tablet or computer, you're dealing with the one mineral called coal tan and is only found in Africa. Natural resources that power the world come from Africa. What have you heard comes out of England? What have you heard comes out of France? What have you heard comes out of um, the Netherlands? chocolate they manufacture everything but the raw goods come from africa so they are jealous because our god that is not the god they presented to us our god gave us everything to find a sufficient life their God, on the other hand, did not give them everything. Where they found themselves cold, without food, land that barely can produce food, a scarcity of animals, a scarcity of minerals. So they look at us with envy. And I'm going to tell you, the very first trip that I took to Africa, I understood this comment and not to say that I'm going to validate the comment, but it may be understand the comment. And this is the comment. Africans are lazy. All right. We hear that all the time. Blacks are lazy. They're lazy. They're lazy. Well, look at this. If you can stand on the land that your God gave me, gave you, and you look to the left and you see corn, and you look to the right and you see pineapples and tomatoes and onions and cantaloupe and watermelon and all form of greens and herbs and everything. Everything is just there growing wild. The hardest you have to work is to pick the fruit, to break it open and eat it. That's why the black man is lazy because God gave him everything and he did not have to work as hard as the European did in Europe for food. The reason why they left Europe searching for other lands because they were scratching their head and said, it got to be something better in the world than this. Yes, champagne, yes, they're known for that. 
So, but my point is, the majority of the things that we partake in every day, the raw materials are coming from Africa and they are manufactured in Europe. Man, um, Europe is a manufacturing um, hub of just about all the products that we enjoy. So they don't hate us. They hate that they cannot be us. They hate that they did not get the blessing that we got. So that's why there is a race. That's why the word race was coined to, to be able to dominate and secure life. Because with low fertility rates, scarcity of food, sickness and disease, as well as being warmongers, the Caucasian race was looking at their mortality and their demise. They summed it up. We are not going to last unless we make a change, unless we find some other lands where we can secure and master food. So when they got the Africa, and saw all the food and all the people, they burned with that green eye of jealousy. But they came up with a plan to master. They didn't come to Africa for naught. They came for life. So we sustain their life. And even if we go into the annals of American history, they will tell you that when the first group of pilgrims came, they starved to death and died because one, they didn't know how to plant. They didn't know how to farm. They didn't bring uh, vegetables with them to plant, livestock and so forth and so on. They didn't know how to hunt. They didn't know how to sustain their life. So when they first came to America, they died off. They starved to death and died. So they got brave two years later. Within two years, they sent another group and they met the same fate. But it was only the third time that they understood what they really had to do. And that was to go get that African that was blessed with the planting of the seeds and the harvesting the crops and developing um, I mean, growing, I mean, you, you know what I'm saying, producing the cows and the cattle. That third time they went and they brought back Africans with them to the Americas. And it was only then that they grew tobacco and they were able to develop a crop and develop food that they could live. And that's where we get 16, uh, well, they say 16, 19, but when they incorporated Virginia as a colony because now the people could live, now they could thrive. They had a basis in which to have a colony and expand. But without the African, history tells us, American history tells us that the Caucasian did not thrive. They starved to death and died. But I asked the question, why would you starve and die when there are people here that are living and alive? Their aim was focused totally on their survival. Their survival and their survival only, which made them unfriendly. They saw the Native Americans as their enemy versus as their friend. And I truly believe that had they come with the attitude to be friendly to the Native Americans, they would have shown them or given, shared their crop or given them seeds so they can be able to produce their own. But they came with the spirit, with the spirit to alienate and take. And that's what they did. 
That's what history tells us. So um, we have to understand the people and their motives. And that motive was self survival. Yeah. That's they had I'm... to survive. Yeah. And that is why um, when you read letters after the colonies began to thrive, how fat the Americans were, something that they had not heard of in Europe because they did not have sufficient food. So that was propaganda also to bring more European people over to America to populate the land. Mm. And the reaching factor was we found food. We know how to grow it and we're surely eating it now. Teach. Everything off our backs. Everything off our backs. Mm -hmm. Teach. Miss Duckworth, I, you got to know it's Juneteenth because y'all just letting up the knowledge today. Like, good grief. Sheesh. Thank goodness I just keep, you know, letting y'all have the floor and me just sitting back and I'm just listening, which everybody who's listening or watching the show should do. Because now we're at a time where it's now shut up and listen. And just hearing all of this great knowledge all through the show does bring it. Right here. It's, it's just right here. So we actually come to the um, last segment of the show and then to our final thoughts. So the last one, and Miss Duckworth, you actually touched on a little bit, the media. Um, so at one of our protests, somebody got to acting out. It was really minor. But where do you think the media went to? They went back to the person acting out. So whenever things pop off, I run to the center of it, right? And we try to resolve it. Um, and I begged the media. I said, look, the real story is up there. Ain't nothing going on back here. Y'all taking advantage of this woman's mental illness. She's mentally ill. You know, I mean, I scolded them so tough and begged. I said, go, can you go back up there. They wouldn't go. Well, they, we went. <laughs> After we went back to the front, I grabbed the mic and I just said, look, whatever bleeds, that's what leads. That's all they care about. They have caused so much division and, and confusion. They perpetuate racism. Um, and I just told, because somebody called me for an interview this morning, and I told him, I said, I really don't even want to give you this interview because you sitting up here saying that this was an accident. This wasn't no accident. She meant to do exactly what she did. And so they'll take something and spin it. Now everybody's like, oh, it's y'all fault. Y'all were in the road, this, that, and the third. So they'll spin a story and make it be about something that is not. And in one instance, we had the sheriff down here to give a press conference. It wasn't until after he gave the press conference that we started getting death threats. So the way that media, the, the way the media spins things, um, it does not aid in, in the, the togetherness and the unity that we need to see. Um, I think their job, I know their job is to tear down, to destroy, and um, and to cause confusion in this earth so that we won't see justice. And it's just, it's horrible. I agree with you. Um, the media is out for ratings and things that are controversial, uh, things that can distract from your specific mission, yes, that's what they're going to run with. They're not going to run with anything that's positive that would be inspiring, uplifting, or motivating. Um, uh, no, they're just not going to do that. And uh, America has, has perfected the art of propaganda through whatever means to always um, kind of massage you back to where they want you to be or where they want the public to be. This is a war. We're fighting to try to get things changed through protest, but they're going to try to take a negative spin or they're going to take a, um, what did it, um, quote unquote, a fake moral high road 
like with um, David um, Castle was saying, well, you know, they're losing their business and blah, blah, blah. And I think we mentioned it on another show. You don't know that relationship that business owner had with the community. That business owner been in business for X, Y, Z years and they don't know anybody in the community, but it is the community that pay for their house, to pay for their children to go to college, that pay for uh, whatever their lifestyle has afforded. Every dollar that comes into their store is a black dollar. It is not green. It's a black dollar. Therefore, um, sometimes karma is a payback. Not saying that all business owners are bad or racist. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying how many of those business owners that you're crying about, how many of them um, were about the community? How many of them took ownership in the community? How many of them knew what was going on in the community? Or were they just there setting up shop, taking money, and living their lives? So the media, um, back to the... Um, the um, statement, the media always does a negative spin. And that's why and we talked about this the other day. That's why we absolutely must uh, have our own media and control our stories. Which that's a slogan of the show. We control the narrative. And that's why you have, I know I'm not the one breaking the mold when I do this show. I, I know I'm not breaking the mold. But I want us to stick out in what we talk about rather than coming out and being frustrated. Yes, we know it's racism. Yes, we know it's white privilege. Yes, we know that the media is all effed up. But we go into details and get the solutions and say why we at this point. Because there's a difference in just going on this show and just going on, on a rant. We give you the history. We tell you from our views. And where can we go from here? And that's a good point. And then it also goes back to what Martin was saying. We need to have more ownership of platforms like this. And that voices like ours need to be heard. Unfortunately, you will not see it on CBS's. You will not hear it on the uh, um, ABC's. You're not going to hear it on the CNN's. You're not going to hear it on the Fox News. You're not going to hear it on the OAN's. You're not even going to hear it on MSNBC. You're not going to hear it but you will hear it on here. And I will promise you that. And we will not say in a way where it offends people. And I always say this, if you on this show and you hear it and you listen to the thoughts and statements from us and it make you feel some type of way, maybe it's you that's the problem. Cause I always say that, I always say that also in the media that there are reporters that actually do their job. They actually do good by the community, but you don't hear them as much. They don't because, you know, I believe in the good old boy system It's all over the place. But you do got reporters out there that's actually are putting in the work that's actually trying to put the stories out there. But unfortunately, they are part of the swamp. You remember that term, the swamp. But in this show as well, when we when we say you enter in our world, we mean that. When we say how we feel about things and you feel a little bit different, now it's time for you just to sit back and listen. Rather than just, oh, what was my feelings? I, you know, because there's many times where my bell buddy goes, uh, I thought he was probably going to say something when y'all said something to converse against him. He actually sat there and he listened. He still gave his point of view, but he still listened to each and every one of y'all, which I'm honestly, I'm not surprised. And I'm saying it because, you know, because I know him, but also I'm the other part of me is surprised that he sat back and listens because Ghost is a pretty like, if he hears somebody say something entirely different than what he says, he's going to say something about it. He did not say not one thing to you ladies at all. He basically just sat back, he listened, and he was like, okay, all right. And I promise you, he probably gonna write me, he'll be like, hey, I, I would love to come on the show with those two 
once again. And I hope that he comes back on the show. But yes, Dan, you're right. It'd like to have him. Yeah. Um, and like you said, Dan, truth isn't sexy as they would say for ratings. Because I'm going to keep it real. We don't have 100 people up on here. We have like, what, five, maybe seven. Like Right now, we got one person up in here. But the back end, where I see people come and watch the show after the fact and understand what is going on, that's all that matters to me. Even if we had no viewers up on here, this show still going to go on because eventually somebody's going to watch and it's going to catch on. We're not trying to get viral. We're not trying to sit there and get sparks or try and get a picture or something like this. This is our world and how it should have been said. And I just said, you know what? I'm sick and tired of this. I can't pretend this is going on. I'm creating another platform off my other platform. The foundation of the Alabante show and create this show. And we're going to and I say, I'm going to keep doing it until what Duckworth was saying about the protest. We're not going to stop until we finally get what, what should be coming to us and what should be rightfully ours. What's also in line with, once again, I know she's probably getting sick of me saying this, but this is true. For her to get her voice out, her views out, because this is something that she got, like, she really got my life straight, if she believes it or not, that everybody needs to hear. And then for the audience themselves to join in discussion rather than just watching YouTube, watching news and all that stuff, you just put your comment where they're not even going to freaking read it at all. Where you get people to read your comments during the show and even after the show is done. This is why this show is different from the media. This is why I encourage more people like Gozer to come on Get in that uncomfortable situation of our world and understanding where we're coming from. Don't don't get confused with the P. Diddy's or get confused with the, you know, hood movies and all that stuff. We're hurting right now. Believe it or not, we're hurting. And the sad thing is, why our answers is, yes, they built this country on their backs for free. There's no denying that. But tell me that that's still not going on when you watch. And, and I'm a sports fan. When you see it in the NBA, you see it in the NFL, you see it in all these sports that, major, that are majority black. And you got no, that one owner, only one, what? You got two black owners that I'm thinking of right now. And they're not even like a majority owner. Jordan owns part of the Hornets. Freaking um, uh, Jay-Z owns the Nets. The Brooklyn Nets. He's only, uh, what? He only owns 5%. I think he's like, yeah, 5% of the team. But people think he owns the whole team. He doesn't. So let that just sink into your mental real quick. This is why... We we need, and you need shows like these. Don Lemon ain't gonna say nothing. Yes, I'm calling them out. Don Lemon ain't gonna say nothing. Even the Breakfast Club, Charlemagne, all of a sudden now nah, he's woke and he's talking all black and you know black empowerment, all that stuff. He's not gonna tell you this. Nobody is. But on this show, you will get it. And you want to know the irony about that is. You got two strong black women on this show. And y'all don't get that much props as y'all should. And I know I'm going over. I know I should end the show like 10 minutes ago. But y'all need to hear this. Black women deserve so much damn credit from the civil rights, even during slavery. Harriet Tubman, duh. Y'all led the way while black men was sitting there trying to figure out their head from their asses. Even freaking um, W.E.B. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington was going at it because Booker T. Washington was like, yeah, let's be segregated, but let's show that we can, we can do this. W.E.B. Du Bois was like, hell no. We deserve this land as much as the next person. I understand that you want to see us strong and powerful, but guess what? We're going to play on the same level play field. 
And then who who was uh, um, B Wells? Ida B Wells, if I said that right. She was gangster in how she reported lynching, but you barely even hear her that much. Y'all need to be praised more than anything. Brothers, we got to step up. And hopefully in the eyes of you two, two sisters that you see me as a black man started this show off of my podcast to say enough is enough. If I can't do let's say protest, because I've been out to a couple of the protests. I say, I got a sizable platform that I can do something like this and give y'all a platform so y'all can say how y'all feel as well as myself, but for y'all. And there you go. And, and Maggie Walker. This is history that we're doing. We're going to keep this up. But let me just say a big, 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 not even from my heart, but from the pit of my soul. I know my mom probably would give me a hug if she watched the show, but thank you. Not only just to you two, but to all the sisters out there that's on the front lines that says, you know what? I'll be damned if my son or my daughter have to live in fear just for walking outside and being black. Thank you, and I'm I, and I just and I just went went on full tirade. So, but now we hit the final part of the show, ladies and gentlemen, of our final thought. Teach, I'm gonna let you lead on with this one. I would just like to say um, thank you for this space. Thank you for this time um, to speak on all of these various issues. My passion is to uplift, motivate, and inspire all who will hear my message. And I live that legacy. So many students of every race always thank me for how I impacted their life. And when I do that, I am fulfilled. So my final thought is, I walk in my passion, I walk in my mission, I am my passion, I am my mission. And my mission is to uplift, motivate, and inspire. Thank you so much, Teach. You up. All right. Well, first of all, let me clarify, because I consider this as a part of media spreading awareness. So some media outlets are getting it. So I just want to say thank you to you for providing the platform for our voices to be heard, because at the end of the day, that's what we need to do. Continue to sound the alarm. Continue to sound the alarm. Put in the after work. Be consistent. Be there every time. Show up. We can get things done if we unite. Stop dividing ourselves because of our differences. And let's grow stronger together based on our strengths. We can do it. And I say this all the time. And that's why my heart was just jumping for joy when Teach said that, is that we are all one. Something happens to one of us, it happens to all of us. We need to learn how to love each other. The Bible says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So if you're having a hard time loving, look inside. And it's okay because we all fall short. But just know that you can redeem yourself. You can restore yourself. God can restore you and allow you to love the way that you're supposed to love. That only happens through true relationship with him. Not religion, but true relationship and having a spiritual relationship with the Father. So let's all love each other the way that we're supposed to. Let's all continue to fight this fight. Let's be proactive and let's reactive and let's fight for this change. And the change is going to be in each and every one of us. 
doing the necessary things that we need to do to grow this world into the America that we need to see. Mm. Just getting deep at the end. So I guess it's my <laughs> turn now. <laughs> um, Dang, Teach, you know what? Now you got that one song by uh, Amazing Beverly. We are one. Now I'm going to be listening to that after I finish the show. But Maya, since I start my uh, opening statements on a real, like, tough number, I thought it was it would be appropriate if I end it on a good note. And that is potato salad, raisins or not. Nah? And I say this, nah. You do not put raisins in potato salad. Now, there has been one time I went to a get together. And as I looked at the potato salad, I literally thought there was little roaches up in there. I was like, yo, what is up with this potato salad? With these? What, what, what's this? My friend like, oh, no, man, that's raisins. I'm like, huh? Raisins? Raisins. So being the type of curiosity person that I am, I gave it a try. They might as well would have had roaches up in there because that's the one thing that was coming to the back of my mind. I was like, who in the hell thought of putting raisins and potato salad? So for anybody who have a family member, because I don't know no young kids, you know, youngins that make potato salad with raisins. So go to that one family member. Their auntie, your mom, or that one sister-in-law, or that cousin, that last cousin on the other side of your father's um, side of the family tree. Tell them, please, keep your hands off those raisins when you make that potato salad. Because raisins does not need to be in any damn food like that. Stop. Please, stop. Now, was I was I a little too much there, you know? I mean, no, no raisins in the potato salad? <laughs> no, no raisins in the potato salad. He's not invited to the cookout. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was I was seeing if I would go a little bit far. I like to say I know I'm not the only one. So yeah, I I I had to end the show on the on a happier note because I started it on a serious one. But once again, I appreciate each and every one of y'all for tuning into the show. Not only just the panel, but you who is watching this show. Thank you so very, very much. Now Doc Worth, I always do this on the show. I always ask Teach, so you're going to be a part of this when I ask. Will you be able to tune to, um, not tune in, but to join the panel on Monday or any other day next week? Monday, we are actually um, protesting for the resignation of a mayor who made some racial comments um, to me and some, to some other people. So Monday, we are gathering to um, call for her resignation. If she does not resign, we will be um, taking the necessary steps to recall her. We already have the votes, and that's what it is. How about this? You just gave me an idea. Um, how about for first time ever, because this is how this show rolls, you should broadcast it live when we do it. Teach, what you think? I think you should go and cover it alive. Okay. Awesome. I will. So just yeah. So just send us the details and we work it from there. It be it be our first, and I will push it out. I will advertise it, and this is going to be on Monday, right? It's Monday, and I have something called a Mevo camera. So maybe I'll figure out how to work that with your streaming. To uh, yeah, let's talk. <laughs> all right. Cool. 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 Um, we can uh, we can all uh, talk a little bit after the show is done. But other than that, y'all, we have to go. Once again, thank y'all for tuning in. Teach, you're going to be, obviously, you're going to be back here on Monday. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much, Queen Mother. I just am so grateful to have shared this platform with you. Your knowledge, your oh. wisdom, your love, <laughs> your compassion, your heart. 
God bless you. I know I don't know you, but I love you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I feel the same way about you, too. I felt your passion about the protest, and I would like to get your number, and uh, okay. we can talk personally. Okay. Right. Yes. 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 Please. Let's do that. Thank you. Well, thank both of y'all for being on the show. Thank you for being on the show once again, um, Teach. Even though you are a fixture on this panel, you are already uh, you are already rocking a lot of boats <laughs> as of late. So keep on rocking the boats. And then, hey, thank you, man. Thank you for uh, tuning into the show. For everybody for tuning into the show. As for myself, once again, Alamonte Thirty One, down to Alamonte Morris, to Anita Joe, aka Teach, and to Miss Duckworth. Thank you for being part of the show. And also for um, my boy, um, Goza, David Goza, thank you for being on this show. And hopefully we will have him back. Thank you. Let's all be out. And also, once again, happy Juneteenth. Not only just to all of us and to you, but also to our ancestors when they finally got the word that slavery was over. Yeah. Even for those... Yeah. Power even, to the people. Uh, power to the people. We're still even, fighting. <laughs> even for those who got late, they still got their freedom. Ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all for tuning in. And y'all just hold on. And we, I'll be back right back, talk to y'all after the show. But everybody else, y'all got to go. Catch y'all later. <laughs> Bye-bye. All right. <laughs>